This week, Siskel and Ebert review Meryl Streep, Glenn Close, and Winona Ryder in the epic drama, The House of the Spirits. Joe Pesci and Christian Slater become urban vigilantes in Jimmy Hollywood. Plus, Tom Berenger and Charlie Sheen dream of baseball glory in Major League Two. Damn, tell me you acting, huh? Right. Yeah. I seen you in anything? Uh, you ever see that show, Matlock, The Roll of Cliff? Oh, you was on that show? No, I was up for The Roll of Cliff. Joe Pesci plays a Hollywood lowlife who dreams of becoming a major actor in Jimmy Hollywood, the latest film from Oscar winning director Barry Levinson, and one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with new films starring Meryl Streep, Glenn Close, and Charlie Sheen, and sequels to two smash sports comedy hits, The Mighty Ducks and Major League. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first film is Jimmy Hollywood, and it's the kind of film that sounds like a better idea than it plays like. The movie stars Joe Pesci in an entertaining performance as Jimmy Alto, a would-be actor who has been unemployed for years and haunts the coffee shops of Hollywood Boulevard with his sidekick, a dim-witted kid played by Christian Slater. So what'd you do, scare yourself to death thinking you were going to sleep and a mummy was coming in your room at night? This schmuck! This mummy is in Cairo. It's got to take a plane from Egypt to Philadelphia. This mummy has got to get a passport. And you're worried he's coming in your room at night? Oh, this mummy's got more important things on its mind. One day, Jimmy gets mad when his car radio is ripped off, and the cops don't even seem to care. So he decides to make videotapes of the thieves and send them to local TV stations, embarrassing the cops. Jimmy's girlfriend, played by Victoria A. Brill, thinks he's crazy. So you guys are now the SOS? What? The note. You guys are now the SOS? What did you put in that note? I just signed it. I mean, it, ha it had to come from somebody. Yeah, but where'd you come up with SOS? It's a movie producer guy. What movie producer guy? It's his initials, a guy who did Gone with the Wind. David O. Selznick? David? I thought his name was Steven. No, Steven is Spielberg. David is O. Selznick. Before he quite understands what's happening, Jimmy has created a mythical vigilante group and is its spokesman. Becoming another one of those media freaks. Those people that can make it into celebrities. This is not about celebrityism. This is about the craft of acting. It's not a vigilante who's popular. It's an actor portraying a vigilante. Jimmy Hollywood is a movie that starts as a closely observed character study and then it takes a wrong turn into a dumb Hollywood caper plot. My guess is that Barry Levinson, who wrote and directed it, had a picture of this guy named Jimmy and his world, and he wanted to make a movie about that, but then he thought he had to attach this idea to a contrived plot in order to keep the audience's attention, or maybe to get a studio to back it. So about halfway through, we start losing the human touches and getting the media circus and the big sensational climax at the end. My other guess is that an audience might have been more interested if Levinson had kept the movie on a smaller human scale. You can sense it when Jimmy Hollywood goes on automatic pilot, and that's too bad because the movie starts out well. That's exactly my review. I mean, I'm sure that he was driving through Hollywood or has driven through Hollywood and seen these fringe characters scurrying along the side streets, looking at the magazine racks and all that in the middle of the night and said, you know, there's a good character study here. The, the reality of their life and the dreams that we're all sharing out yeah. there in big time. Mm -hmm. But then you're right. He takes that interesting study, and Pesci could have played it very well. Mm -hmm. In fact, Pesci played that kind of character when he played the Ouija photographer uh, before. Yeah, but he plays it well in this film, too. There's nothing really wrong run, with Pesci's performance except what the character does yeah. goes all wrong. We don't believe just, it no. for a second. It's, a, it's sitcom material, and it doesn't work. You're okay, absolutely next right. Next movie, and it's the animated children's film Thumbelina, and we've said this before with pictures like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. The stakes have really been raised on animated musical features, and Thumbelina just doesn't cut it. It seems like a bad 20-year-old picture telling the story of a teeny tiny little girl and those forces that would like to marry her off and keep her from her career and her prince. How weak is this picture? Compare this opening number to, say, the first scene in Beauty and the Beast, where we get to know Belle and her passion for books as she walked through that village. Here, Jody Benson, the voice of The Little Mermaid, 
plays and introduces us to Thumbelina. Who would believe the wonder of the world I see? Each little minute brings a new surprise. There's only one peculiar thing that bothers me. And how about the prince? His name is Cornelius. Now, there's a name today's kids can really thrill to, but what's worse, he's a wimp. We'll see the universe and dance on Saturn's rings. Tonight with me and I will be your way. Among the bad guys, a Mrs. Toad who wants to make Thumbelina a star in a road show with her sons. What a dull villain. And in a ripoff from Aladdin, the comic Gilbert Godfrey, the scratchy voice of the parrot in Aladdin, is cast here as a rude beetle. I'm a connoisseur of sweet nectars, a designer of rare threads, and a judge of beautiful women. Nothing about Thumbelina works. Not the drawing style, not the script, not the lead characters, not the songs. I found nothing memorable. It will sell no toys. It will not leave you humming anything as you exit the theater. I found it to be a complete waste of time. And once again, we're in complete agreement. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was thinking about while watching this film is it's obviously not going to be of interest to anyone except for small kids. Oh, maybe. Give them. And I don't think they're going to no, like no, it no. that much. But no. what I was thinking is small kids aren't that interested in romance. I don't think. I was trying to remember my own grade school days. I didn't really care if Thumb Thumbelina is going to marry Prince Cornelius right. because I didn't care about courtship and marriage. I cared more about colorful characters and adventure at that age. And this whole movie is basically about this little girl and whether or not she's going to marry her Prince Charming yeah. or whether she's going to be married off to, to Mrs. Toad's son oh, but or to uh, the mole who yeah. wants to marry or all these right. sleazy little animals yeah. that want to marry Thumbelina. And who cares? They're all unattractive. Even the good people are unattractive yes. here. When we come back, it's a new season with more big league troubles in the baseball film Major League Two. Go out there and win it for Cleveland. Win it for yourselves, and win it for me. That ought to shrink a little sphincter. Do you have no? Do you have no? Marbles! Marbles? Players from Cuba and Japan get into a linguistic and religious argument in Major League Two, which is a sequel to the 1989 hit about the most disorganized team in baseball, which in this case is supposed to be the Cleveland Indians. Now it's the start of the next season for the Indians, and Coach Tom Berenger is having trouble with big egos and small talents. The gutless wonder doesn't have to pitch. Why should I have to run? Who are you calling a gutless wonder, Tin Man? Tin Man? I got a genuine leg injury here, pal. Yeah, that limp is the best acting you've done all year. But at least I don't have some cover girl dragging me around by my junts. The pitcher there was Charlie Sheen, known as Wild Thing. He was broken up with last season's girlfriend, Michelle Burke. But now she has a job which apparently consists of bringing needy kids to the ballpark every single day. What a great woman. Man, I'm a White Sox fan. That's such a nice personality. But he loves the idea of me sitting out here in the bullpen. Really sexy, too. I've met the woman, Rube. I don't need a description, all right? White Sox fan. Women can't live without him and they can't be standing up. The best thing in the movie is the relationship between the alcoholic sportscaster played by Bob Euchre and his timid sidekick, Skip Grappera. Hello, Tribe fans. Welcome back to Major League Baseball. Sort of. Pay to tennis today is 1412. Some of them were driven away by a little 10-run first inning the Red Sox put up. Take over, Marty. I'm in the bag. Me? Major League Two is Major League Boring. What we have here basically is the side of a group of actors and filmmakers who have been well paid to recycle a hit and are going through the motions without a single new inspiration. This movie doesn't even try to be informed and insightful about sports. It's just a collection of a bunch of weirdos and losers who very predictably get their act together just in time for the prefabricated ending. Boy, yeah. looking at this movie was like one of those 
forgotten oldies shows, you know. Why were these oldies forgotten? Because there was a well, good you reason. Well, you know, it's, it's just um, the same complaint I had with Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. They didn't try. No. They didn't, you know, you could have turned, there's so many young people that want to write scripts in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You could have farmed this out for nothing. You could have said, for $500, I want you to write me a new scene with the Charlie Sheen character. Yeah. And you could have had 12 people uh -huh. handle uh -huh. it like that and would have done it just to get a screen credit you know, or even associate themselves with the picture in some way. Anyone who watches a baseball game on television twice a year knows more about baseball than this movie gives the audience credit for. That's what uh, disgusted me. It's just, a, it's a generic movie. It could have been about any sport. That's true. Coming up next, Meryl Streep returns to the screen with such heavyweights as Jeremy Irons, Glenn Close, and Winona Ryder in The House of the Spirits. Mrs. Patron, you're the mightiest and richest man in town. I wouldn't ask anybody else. How come you need so much? Jeremy Irons plays a land baron in Chile in The House of the Spirits, a would-be epic film about a half a century of Chilean history featuring an all-star cast in what turns out to be a deadly dull film that appears to have lost any subtlety with its editing and now consists mostly of scenes of famous actors, brilliant actors, shouting at each other. It's kind of embarrassing. Told in flashback from the present, the story takes us back to the 1920s to meet Jeremy Irons as a young man who uses peasant labor to develop some gold mines. And he also has lost one lover and now has taken her sister, Meryl Streep, as his new bride. Meeting her here is Irons' spinster sister, played by Glenn Close, who at first is jealous of Streep. She's not a child, Farrell. You don't have to treat her like one. Years later, we meet Irons and Streep's daughter, played by Winona Ryder, probably the least interesting character in the film. She seems more like a California girl than a Chilean, and much to the anger of her increasingly right-wing father, she has an affair with a peasant rebel, Antonio Banderas. You might remember him as Tom Hanks's lover in the movie Philadelphia. Say you've started making political speeches. The peasants here are suppressed by your father. They are afraid of him. They all hate him. Pedro. Promise me to be careful. Nothing must ever happen to you. Streep and Irons are constantly at each other's throats over their daughter's affair and the sad state of their own marriage. Get ready for the yelling that is so typical of this movie. She's my daughter! If she'd done this with someone from a decent family, then maybe, maybe I could have understood. But with that sneaky, dirty little son of a... I'll kill him! I swear on my mother's soul! Later on in the 1970s, after a military coup, soldiers come to arrest Ryder because of her association with Banderas, and she pleads with Irons to help save her lover. Talk about an overwrought scene. You know what love is like. And I love Pedro the way that you loved Mama. He's my entire life, Papa. There's a lot wrong with the House of the Spirits. You can start with Jeremy Irons, who is never convincing in this role. He always seems to be pushing his accent and then straining to age convincingly throughout the picture. Meryl Streep has a thankless role, I think, as a slight beauty and then a harpy. Glenn Close is angry all of the time. I've already dismissed Winona Ryder's performance. I guess the lesson here is that as good as these actors can be, they do need a script. There are individual shots in this film that do suggest the epic that the House of Spirits might have been, but the script would have needed a severe rewrite and probably would have had to run at least an hour longer to take in and give some depth to these characters. In its present state, however, that extra hour would have been torture. Well, I didn't, uh, I liked Winona Ryder's performance, but oh. I feel in general that Jeremy Irons, Glenn Close, and Meryl Streep are the last three actors you would put on a list to appear in a movie of Isabella Linde's book, of the House of the Spirits. This is a Latin story. Mm -hmm. it, it involves magic realism. It involves passion. It involves revolution. It, revo it involves romance. Yeah. And uh, as you look at it on the screen, directed by Billy August, who was Danish and who one of whose movies was Ingmar Bergman's Best Intentions, this movie is wrong in exactly the same way 
the best intentions would have been if it had been cast entirely with a Spanish uh, or Latino cast. They're not convincing. Uh, these people do not see, they seem like a road company mm -hmm. who seem to be implanted on the soil. And when you look at the Latino actors in the movie, such as Antonio Banderas or Maria Conchita Alonso, they have a naturalist with this material. The, the magic realism that goes through all of these scenes is treated uh, by the leading actors more like kind of a, a social gaffe than like a psychic gift. They kind of uh, you know, at one point, the table floats up and Irons pushes it back down again. They don't seem to inhabit uh, the reality that this novel tried to create. It's a big misguided project. When we come back, the Minnesota Junior Hockey Stars are America's team in D2, the Mighty Ducks. And just when you think they're about to break apart, ducks, ducks fly together! To the Mighty Ducks, and it's a sequel to the 1992 movie where Emilio Estevez coached a bunch of junior Minneapolis misfits to the local hockey title. Now they're back with new uniforms, new recruits, and a new name, Team USA, as a powerful sporting goods company backs their entry at the Junior Goodwill Games. I guess it's an unwritten rule that all sports movies have to begin with the team unable to work together. Everyone goes their own way, everyone falls down. The villains this time, the Icelandic team, who bear a certain resemblance to the mean East German team in another hit sports movie, Cool Running. Off the face of knocked down by Gunnar Stahl, and the heavy hitting by Iceland continues. It's going to take something drastic for Team USA to turn this game around. There are a couple of interesting things I want to mention about D2, The Mighty Ducks. One is the narrative style of this movie. The entire film is shot like a commercial. There is a bare minimum of dialogue scenes longer than 30 seconds. The whole thing is music, montage, quick action, and voiceover dialogue while something fast is happening on the screen. Another interesting aspect is the movie's bias against corporate sponsorship. One of the bad guys in the movie is the marketing man in charge of promoting the sporting goods company through venal tie-ins with the team. But, of course, this movie itself is a promotion, in a way, for the real Anaheim Mighty Ducks hockey team, and so that anti-capitalist slant seems a little contradictory. Apart from that, I don't know. It's a formula picture with a lot of energy, but I give it marginal thumbs down. Well, I have the Certainly not as bad as Major League it, Two. You know what? It's the best film on this show, which isn't <laughs> saying a lot. Um, my problem was with the adults. The kids are, the, the energy... The kids are the kids. kids are, yeah, although, yeah. I mean, you couldn't, the stereotyping, I mean, well, when they play this the... This is like a World War II platoon in a 1948 it. movie. You got Absolutely. one of everything. Yeah, I know. And, and that's Two a of something in some yeah, cases. Yeah. Um, I thought that the biggest contradiction, if you want to point them out, is within the world of the film, mm -hmm. is the attitude toward violence. The Icelandic hockey team, which I think is hilarious that they had to go to Iceland to find a politically correct villain these days. <laughs> You know, ooh, you know, those, the danger in Reykjavik that's going to swarm over the planet. And, you know, I mean, it just, I was laughing at that all along. Anyway, is that they're dirty players, right? Yeah, huh? But how about the goons that work for the Mighty Ducks yeah, team? Well, that's hockey for you. The Ducks fight back, and yeah. that's how they win. Okay. Yeah. But uh -huh. it's the adults who are really boring, and, and Emilio Estevez's character is the most lackluster element in, in the film. Actually, I would have thought yeah, it would have yeah. been great, great if the marketing man had taken over as the coach in the last minute substitution. That would have been fun. Coming yeah. up next, our video pick of the week, one of the best recent films about the generation before Generation X. Yeah, These are kids who grew up in the 70s, and it's now available on home video. Do you guys know anything about a party here tonight? With the artistic failure and box office disappointment of the recent release of Reality Bites, Hollywood's conventional wisdom is that today's moviegoers might not be interested in recent generations of disaffected young people. But last year, there was a very good film about the growing pains of teenagers in the late 70s. It's called Dazed and Confused, and it's just now being released on home video, a film very sharp about the pointless, disillusioning rituals that a lot of kids were then put through, including high school kids hazing the incoming freshmen. Also running through this smartly written picture is a general dissatisfaction with the culture of the day of the late 70s, which led to a lot of kids listening to the official noise of protest, heavy metal music. Maybe the 80s will be radical, you know? I figure we'll be in our 20s and, hey, it can't get any worse. Dazed and Confused was written and directed by Richard Linklater, who has a fine ear for the dialogue of that time. He's also cast this picture very well with such actors as Jason London, Michelle Burke, and Rory Cochran. 
Days and Confused is my video pick of the week, and now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs down for Jimmy Hollywood with Joe Pesci, the failed attempt by writer-director Barry Levinson to plumb the dark side of the Hollywood dream. Two thumbs down, way down, for the dreary animated feature Thumbelina, a dated, dull piece of work. Two more thumbs down, way down, for Major League Two, the baseball sequel with an all-too-familiar cast of cut-ups given nothing fresh to do here. Two thumbs down for The House of the Spirits with its all-star cast that we think is miscast. Meryl Streep, Jeremy Irons, Glenn Close, and Winona Ryder. And finally, hey, it was not a great week, two thumbs down for D2, The Mighty Ducks, with stereotypical kids skating through a predictable story also occupied by boring adults led by Emilio Estevez. You know, this was such a bad week, I want to go back to your video pick and talk about that because I, even though I gave that movie thumbs up, Dazed and Confused, yeah. it stayed with me in such a way that yeah. I think I probably should have given it even a better review than I did. And his first film, uh, called Slacker, is right. also out on video and also worth seeing. Dazed and Confused is worth a second look. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with Red Rock West starring Nicolas Cage and Dennis Hopper in a case of hired killers and mistaken identities. Also, Threesome, starring Laura Flynn Boyle as the center of an undergraduate love triangle. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.